need to know how to do gonioscopy. Um, and the aim of today is to teach you to do it better than you do it already and to give you the confidence to do it on anyone if you're not already doing that. And because it's uncomfortable when it requires contact, a lot of people don't do it in practice. But the reason we're doing it is fundamentally for the vast majority of cases, we're looking for contact between the peripheral cornea at corneoscleral junction and peripheral trabecular meshwork um, with the very peripheral iris. So the main principles, minimum light, minimum distortion, and minimum discomfort, because you would like your patient to come back. So we need adequate anesthesia, a narrow beam, we need to identify the corneoscleral wedge, and we're doing it in the dark. So adequate anesthesia is the most, the most important thing. Generally, I use proxymeticane and then something else. So oxybuprocaine or tetracaine. Look up to the ceiling, please. The reason we try and minimise the amount of light falling on the eye and have the room lights down is all about maximising the chances of detecting angle closure. There's nothing else. You can see everything you want to see with the lights on. Um, but if you're trying to look for angle closure, you want the pupil to be in its natural resting closest to mid dilated state as you can and that's really the only reason for turning the lights off but there's very good evidence that if you turn the lights if you leave the lights on you'll miss a lot of angle closure because the angle can change so readily for looking at the front of the eye i always try and have a look first so just do a simple van herrick type limbal anterior chamber depth assessment with a relatively short beam and a very very narrow bright beam so taking the gonioscope with lots of whatever coupling fluid you're using, it wants to be something that stays there if you turn the lens upside down. If it's too liquid, it will just drop off and it'll make life awkward. The lamp housing for the top and bottom angles is angulated off to one side with a vertical beam. And if you don't do that, you will not be looking onto the, lens, onto the um, light from the side. You'll be looking at it from straight on. So there are then different ways of inserting the lens and no way is necessarily better than the other. But what I tend to do is use my ring finger to hold the lower lids, ask them to look up, angulate the lens towards the eye. And then here I've got the angulated beam and you're looking for the beam from the side on. And then what you see is basically brown iris and then white sclera above it. And sometimes you see some brown lines along that. What you are trying to find is the corneal wedge. And that is the outermost peripheral point of the cornea. And that's the point at which the cornea is turning into sclera. And that is Schwabe's line. And the reason that that's important is that Schwabe's line is the anterior most extent of trabecular meshwork. That is the sort of picture that you get. It's blurred. Um, it, this, it's not obvious to start with. If you just use brown stripes to identify your landmarks, you can get confused because the brown stripes can be very, very different. Often you get pigment in front of Schwabe's line, then you get anterior trabecular meshwork, then you get posterior pigmented trabecular meshwork, and then you come back down into the iris, sometimes sitting on the ciliary body face. So what you see is a series of brown stripes, and what you need the, short, the corneoscleral wedge to do is identify those, which of those brown stripes are which. You're trying to generate a picture like that, which is a narrow, off to one side, narrowed, very, very thin, but bright beam, shortened, because you don't want too much extraneous light, endothelium, epithelium coming down to join in a, in a wedge there, defining where Schwabe's line is, and then everything beyond that is trabecular meshwork leading down to scleral spur. And it can be a number of different shapes, but it's that sort of blunt edge. Sometimes <coughs> it's very pointy, sometimes it's round-edged. That's very, very thin, thinning it right the way down to get that sort of wedge-shaped structure there. You can see there are lots of brown stripes down here, which are very confusing as to what they might be. If you have a broad beam, you can see the angle nicely, but you can't see that corneoscleral wedge landmark. Whereas when we start off, thinning it right the way down, that's telling me that, ah, oh, here's my landmark. So this, that line across here is going to be, be Schwabe's line, and in front of it is trabecular meshwork.